Greetings everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here, or you've been sitting in the shadows, please make best friends with that subscribe button and set your notification bell to all. That way you don't miss every time I upload, which tends to be daily. Also, if you would like to become a member of Back to Ashes or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin, entitled True Driving at Night Horror Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I usually sit in the front of the bus. Maybe because I am very close to an entrance. Maybe because I feel more secure being close to the driver. I just hang down my head, listening to my headphones, but always just with one of them, because I want to hear what is happening around me. This was the very first time I had seen him. I hear when he started to speak with me. I put down my headphones. The bus was very empty. It was just me and one other person, far back, at the end of the bus. The driver was between 30 to 40 years old. Yeah, I am really bad about ages. He looked just like a regular bus driver at that age. A little overweight with blonde hair and a couple of days going without a shaving. Are you heading to work? I replied. Yeah. Because this bus was a common line to the one large workplace around my area. He asked a couple of questions, just some small talk, and I did not mind. And then... He talked about his ex and her kids. She called the police on me. I just needed to put my lotion on my crotch. The kids were in the bathroom with me, just as I needed to put it on because the doctor told me that I needed to do it every day. I froze. I did not see that coming. I then heard his story about how he was not a pedophile. He just needed to put on the ointment on his bits and it just happens to be at the same time as his girlfriend's kids were around him and then all the details and that she was a crazy bitch i did not know how to respond i think i told him something about yeah but if you are innocent they will see it that way or some shit like that it was the longest bus ride i had ever been on i just wanted it to end I thought of calling the bus company, but on the other hand, he was already under investigation by the police. I never called them. I never forgot the last line in our conversation. Do you have kids? I told him that I did not. I've gone back and forth with this story because I'm not sure if it's actually creepy or if I'm just super bothered by semi-trucks in general. This happened back in March. My sister and I were heading to an airport for our 6 a.m. flight to Orlando, Florida to visit Universal Studios. So, this incident happened between 3 to 3.30 a.m. We're driving along the interstate when we come up behind a semi-truck. The semi is keeping up with traffic, so my sister decides to not pass him, knowing that I really hate being next to big trucks, because I'm just scared of them. My family has had a few close calls with them, and I've personally known people who have lost loved ones in horrific accidents involving these kinds of trucks. For a while, being behind the truck was fine. Like I said, it was keeping up with the flow of traffic and being fine. But then, about 20 minutes in, the driver starts doing a few bizarre things. The truck will start to break, or it starts to swerve into the next lane. There is literally nothing in front of the truck, 
nor is it stormy. It was a cloudy night, but not windy. We weren't following the truck very close, but after that, my sister backs off even more. Soon enough, we're away from the rest of traffic, and it's just us and the truck. It's still randomly hitting the brakes. When it suddenly swerves off the lane and hits the rumble stripes, I finally said, Will you please pass this truck? He's being really weird. My sister agrees with me and starts gaining speed to just get around the truck quickly. As she signals and switches the lanes, the truck speeds up a little bit. My sister doesn't let that deter her and just hits the gas. When we got up next to the cab of the truck, the driver lays on the horn, starts flashing his high beams, speeds up even more, and starts to swerve over into our lane. My sister floors it and manages to pull her car in front, though we were forced onto the rumble stripes to avoid being sideswiped by this truck. She keeps going fast, and when we got a good distance in front of the truck, she gets back over and starts to slow down a bit. But then, she's just like, Seriously, what is this truck's problem? I look in a side view mirror, and this truck is just hauling ass, like he's trying to catch up with us. My sister speeds up again and is pushing at about 85 miles per hour when we're able to start pulling away from this truck. Speed limit sides are 65 for trucks, 70 for cars. We eventually catch up to the traffic that had left us behind with this truck. From there, we were able to slow down a little more. But with that truck gaining on us again, we passed through them and when the truck caught up with the traffic, he slowed way down and we were able to lose him. I've told this story to a few people and they're always like, oh, sounds like road rage. But I honestly don't know what my sister and I did to piss this guy off if that's the case. But I do know that this trucker made my paranoia around semi-trucks even worse. So, to preface, I'm not a good driver by any stretch of the imagination. At the best of times, I am passable. Keep this in mind. My best friend and I were driving home through an industrial section of our town. Not to say it was a bad area, just a little run down. I was in the left lane on a four-lane road, but there was a good deal of traffic in that lane. I tried to move into the right lane, but little did I know, there was someone a few cars behind me moving into my lane at the same time. She accelerated super quickly, and we almost hit each other, but I let her go ahead of me. I will say that it was probably more my fault than her fault, but her reaction is what was total overkill. After laying on the horn of her car, she starts to periodically slam on her brakes in front of me. We approach a left turn lane, and since that's where I was headed, that's where I signaled to go. She decided to block both left lanes by turning her car sideways across them. We were at a standstill at this red light. As soon as she does this, I start freaking out a little bit, so I stopped with a good distance between her car and mine. I see her passenger door open. This woman started charging towards my car on foot abandoning her car across two lanes of traffic. I still have no idea what she was planning to do once she got out, but about two weeks prior, some girl in my area was shot and killed in a road rage accident. I was taking zero chances. I flung my car into reverse and decided that I was now taking a right turn at this light because I don't care where it leads. I thought that was the end of everything, but I was so, so wrong. She got back in her car as quickly as possible and started following me. I made turn after turn trying to lose this woman while she followed me, trying to swerve and ram into the back of my car. 
My best friend was in the passenger seat screaming and calling every person we know, trying to figure out what to do. After a couple of miles of this woman trying to hit us, I ran a red light and we lost her. We got on the interstate as quickly as possible, but flinched at every black car we saw behind us for a good half hour. Should we have called the cops? Maybe. Did we think of that in the heat of the moment? Definitely not. So, lady who presumably tried to fight two 17-year-old girls at a red light, let's not ever meet again. About 19 years ago, I had a frightening incident while driving home from work in the evening. I was driving down a narrow one-way street with tall, sharp speed bumps. When I see it in my rearview mirror, a rumpled and unshaven-looking driver, who looked to be in his late 40s, in a gold minivan coming up quickly to my rear bumper. He stays barely a foot behind my car, squealing his brakes and nearly rear-ending me several times. He starts to honk his horn in long, angry blasts and yells at me out of his window. I sped up a bit but didn't want to break an axle or suspension on my old compact Toyota, trying to please this aggro man. At the end of this street, I turned onto the larger boulevard, thinking that would be the end of it. He follows me. My heart starts to pound. After about a half mile and a few left and right turns, he's still behind me. I pull over into a space on the side road. He follows, pulls up, and parks right behind me, confirming he is definitely talking to me. He opens his door and steps out to approach my car, his face in a snarl of anger. I quickly pulled out of the parking space. He shouts an obscenity, jumps back in his van, and starts tailing me again. This guy clearly has bad intentions. He continues to trail me for another half a mile on several streets, when I realize I'm getting close to my home street. I eventually turned into the alley that adjoins my gated parking lot, the kind where you have to use a remote control to open the gate. The gate opens, I pull into my lot, and he starts to follow me into the alley. He is actually going to follow me in? Does he realize he won't be able to get back out without a remote to open the gate? He's not quite quick enough. The gate starts to slide shut behind me before he can squeeze in. I can see his livid face in my rear view mirror, screaming something inside his van. I'm afraid to exit my car, worried that another user might open the gate again, allowing him time to drive or walk into the lot. There was a pedestrian entrance to the lot off the main street, but it required a key. He continues to block the alley for about five minutes until another car drives up and honks their horn for him to move out of the way. He eventually backs out of the alley and drives off. My heart finally slowed down. This was when we first moved to Chicago, before I knew where the nearby police or fire stations were, and before anyone had cell phones. I don't report the incident when I got home because I'd been too flustered to take down the plate numbers, frankly. The police most likely wouldn't have done anything anyway. So, road rage driver in the gold minivan. I hope I don't have to see you again. I've gone back and forth with this story because I'm not sure if it's actually creepy or if I'm just super bothered by semi-trucks in general. This happened back in March. My sister and I were heading to an airport for our 6 a.m. flight to Orlando, Florida to visit Universal Studios. So, this incident happened between 3 to 3.30 a.m. We're driving along the interstate when we come up behind a semi-truck. 
The semi is keeping up with traffic, so my sister decides to not pass him, knowing that I really hate being next to big trucks because I'm just scared of them. My family has had a few close calls with them, and I've personally known people who have lost loved ones in horrific accidents involving these kinds of trucks. For a while, being behind the truck was fine. Like I said, it was keeping up with the flow of traffic and being fine. But then, about 20 minutes in, the driver starts doing a few bizarre things. The truck will start to brake or it starts to swerve into the next lane. There is literally nothing in front of the truck, nor is it stormy. It was a cloudy night, but not windy. We weren't following the truck very close, but after that, my sister backs off even more. Soon enough, we're away from the rest of traffic, and it's just us and the truck. It's still randomly hitting the brakes. When it suddenly swerves off the lane and hits the rumble stripes, I finally said, Will you please pass this truck? He's being really weird. My sister agrees with me and starts gaining speed to just get around the truck quickly. As she signals and switches lanes, the truck speeds up a little bit. My sister doesn't let that deter her and just hits the gas. When we got up next to the cab of the truck, the driver lays on the horn, starts flashing his high beams, speeds up even more, and starts to swerve over into our lane. My sister floors it and manages to pull her car in front, though we were forced onto the rumble stripes to avoid being sideswiped by this truck. She keeps going fast, and when we got a good distance in front of the truck, she gets back over and starts to slow down a bit. But then, she's just like, Seriously, what is this truck's problem? I look in the side view mirror, and this truck is just hauling ass, like he's trying to catch up with us. My sister speeds up again and is pushing at about 85 miles per hour when we're able to start pulling away from this truck. Speed limit sides are 65 for trucks, 70 for cars. We eventually catch up to the traffic that had left us behind with this truck. From there, we were able to slow down a little more. But with that truck gaining on us again, we passed through them and when the truck caught up with the traffic, he slowed way down and we were able to lose him. I've told this story to a few people and they're always like, oh, sounds like road rage. But I honestly don't know what my sister and I did to piss this guy off if that's the case. But I do know that this trucker made my paranoia around semi-trucks even worse. Four years ago, after just getting my degree, I decided it was time to leave my hometown and pursue my career. So I moved to a big city that was nine hours away from my parents and most of my family. I had no friends there for months and my starting salary was low because I came into the company as a trainee. I was very demotivated and I missed my family a lot. At some point, I decided to go visit the relatives who lived close by the coast, which was four to five hours away in the car. I didn't have a car and the buses were expensive, but my cousin told me about this Facebook group of rides between my city and another city that was close to their town. I went there and found myself a ride with some university students who were just a few years younger than me. The day for the trip came by. I met them and in total it was five of us in a wide sedan. A lady who was studying medicine, owner of the car, her boyfriend, the driver, a sophomore girl who was friends with them, and one random young guy who found their ad on Facebook. We're just going to call him Mark. It was a Friday, and people from this whole region were infamous for drinking extremely often. So, inspired by the warning my cousin gave me, I awkwardly asked them, 
Sorry to um ask, but none of you have drunk recently or planned to do it on our trip, right? The driver assured me that he was fully sober and that he wouldn't have any, even if the passengers did. After hearing that, his girlfriend and the other girl assured that they wouldn't drink because their parents were very strict and wouldn't let them misbehave. Mark giggled when hearing that and whispered to me, Women in their town are infamous for drinking a lot and denying it. The trip went on and we went around dozens of mountains. We had a few conversations about university and work, but most of the trip was us just listening to music to a popular singer from the 90s. After around two hours and a half, the driver stopped the car at a gas station as he needed the WC. Mark decided to go with them as he wanted to get something from the store. A few minutes later, I see Mark and our driver come back out to the car, even holding a six-pack of cerveza. Well, actually, the driver was carrying two of them. I almost freaked out, but kept my composure and asked them if they were going to drink now. The driver said, I won't until I'm done driving, but let the others and yourself take one or two if they want. Almost two hours later, we had left the mountains and arrived to a flatland. The sign said we were one kilometer away from the city. Suddenly, the car took a right turn, leaving the main road and headed towards the suburbs. The place looked desolated and most of the houses seemed empty. I thought it was a bit weird, but didn't ask anything because I assumed that maybe we were dropping the other girl. They probably already knew where she lived. The dude just parked the car on the yard of an abandoned house and said, We are basically home. You guys down for some drinks? Mark was totally down with it, but the girls kept saying stuff as, Um, I'm not sure... I don't usually drink, or, okay, I'll make this one exception, or, only because we had tough midterms. I refused and said, but how are we going to get to the city? You guys agreed to take me to the bus station. They said that it was already very close, and that in the worst case scenario, I could just walk there. I was more worried because I planned to take the local bus at a certain hour to then get to my cousin's town, which was still an hour away from there. They started drinking really fast, and the girls got to the point where they were trying to pee doing a handstand against a wall. I was desperate to leave, but I didn't feel safe walking to the city because it was really dark out there and this region had a bad reputation for crime. Outsiders were specifically more at risk. There was no phone signal there, so I had to wait for these guys and see what they could offer me. They finally decided it was time to go home. I said it wasn't okay for any of them to drive anymore because they were all drunk and I offered to drive. However, the driver said, it's not up to you. The car belongs to my girlfriend. However, his girlfriend refused, saying that she didn't even know me and her dad wouldn't be okay with a stranger driving the car. I said I understood that, but that we had to sort this out somehow. After a bit, the driver finally got off from the driver's seat. I assumed they would let me drive. I was sitting in the middle of the back seat, so... I asked the guys next to me to let me get off and out of the car. The sophomore girl, who was in my left, did, but before I could stop her, she climbed into the driver's seat. This girl started saying, Friend, please let me drive. It's so close and there's no one outside anymore. The other girl said, Okay, sure, but go slow, okay? The previous driver got into the back seats with me and confined me back to the middle seat. I was getting upset and wanted to stop her, but 
I didn't know how to because everyone seemed okay with this idea. My panic got even worse when the sophomore girl started asking them how to turn on the car and how to operate it. You don't know how to drive a car? I asked in despair. <laughs> no, I don't. It's my first time trying. My parents haven't let me learn yet, she answered. Get down then, please. I have a driver's license. I can get you home safely, I said. Then the car's owner told me. I couldn't decide over her car and said that it would be okay, that there was almost no one out driving at this hour and that they would help her friend learn how to drive. I asked them to let me get off the car and they wouldn't let me. They swore it was a very short drive and that we would go slowly and that it would be okay. The girl really had no idea about how to drive. Unfortunately, this was an automatic transmission car. Had it been a manual one, and she probably wouldn't have been able to drive that one, let alone move it. And the car moved, but in the ways you would expect for it to move with a driver who had never stepped on the pedals of an actual car. She would hit the brake and steer the wheel too hard. She drove in the middle of the road and kept freaking out while the others yelled at her what to do. I was begging them to let me off and get out of the car, but they wouldn't listen to me. Fortunately, the streets were empty, but I couldn't help to fear that if any car would have been out, for sure we would have crashed against it. Eventually, we made it to the street where the bus station was. As soon as they pointed that out, I asked them to just stop the car already and let me walk from there. But they did not. They forced me to be dropped in front of the station. I don't even know how I could get out of this sort of situation if I was in it ever again. Last night, I was coming home from dinner out with a friend whom I hadn't seen in a while. It was pitch black at around 9.40 p.m. when I was finally driving home. I had not been drinking or smoking or anything like that at all. I really wanted to avoid a particular highway because I hit a deer on this highway back in January. The setup is two-way, one lane in both directions. Well, as I'm getting pretty close to home, maybe about three miles out from my house, I have to make a left turn, and at this point, there's two left turn lanes that merge into one lane again shortly after you turn. I was the first car in the right turn lane, and car X was at the second vehicle in the left most turn lane. As we finally get to the green light, I'm going kind of slow, I've been up since 2 a.m. I let the first car of the leftmost lane get in front of me during the merge. As I begin to merge over, I see the very front of car X, giant white Bronco type of a vehicle, trying to overtake me. The problem with this is the front of their vehicle is only by the gas cap on the end of my vehicle, so they can't overtake me without hitting me. So, I speed up just a little bit to successfully make my merge and do a big swerve to the left, then another full swerve to the right. I slow down to see if they're okay or if we made contact. I didn't feel any impact and when I looked at my car, I had or have absolutely no damage. They immediately start speeding up and turn their brights on and start tailgating me. So I'm trying to play it cool and disengage from this road rage. Used to have road rage problems myself. And continue driving normally until we reach the next light, where it splits into two lanes again. I go into the right lane, 
They stayed in the left lane, and, and I end up going around another vehicle and getting in front of them, so there's a buffer car between us now. The lanes merge again immediately after this right. And then, I made a right turn off this street. Now, I'm on the main road in traffic in town, and going kind of slow again. I've calmed down, thinking I've gotten away from whoever angry Car X was. So I turn back onto the one lane road to continue going home. And I see Car X in the closed gas station. I actually didn't notice the car at all. I totally forgot about it and was just ready to go to bed. Then, as I get to my neighborhood, this car pulls up behind, tailgating me again, but with their brights on. I wasn't sure what to do. I've never been in a situation like this before. So I kept making turns on random streets in my neighborhood. Never went to the real part of the neighborhood I live in, though. And after two turns, I can confirm that they were actually following me. So I pulled over and rolled my window down. If they have something to say or want to file a report or get the police involved or whatever, let's just do this because I want to go home and sleep already. I'm thinking they'll pull up and curse me out or say something, but no, they speed past me and pull into a driveway as if they live there. Weird. So I sit there for 30 seconds because I'm not sure how to handle this. Is this all in my head? Were they just going home and are annoyed with me? Should I call the cops? What would I even be reporting that nothing happened but I'm scared? So I drive off and in my rear view mirror, seen them turn their lights back on and make a U-turn. Now I know they were following me. So I actually made a U-turn because I wanted to get their plates. I couldn't when they were behind me because they had their brights on. They ended up parking at a separate house on the other side of the street and opened the garage. I know they actually live there. At this point, I'm pretty pissed off at the lengths this person went to just to potentially follow me home and all over what? For me merging into a lane? How petty is that shit? So I actually keep driving the neighborhood. My guy tells me not to go home. Plus, I hate going home angry. My family can always sense it. As I'm driving, I decided to go to 7-Eleven on the corner. And I just park and start doing breathing exercises. It's now 10.15 p.m. I noticed the silver car that was previously parked on the street where car X is garaged had two skinny-looking teenagers in it who appeared to be looking for coins. One of them eventually goes into 7-Eleven to buy something, so I think I'm just being paranoid and ignore the vehicle. However, on the corner, I see another white vehicle. This one is a Jeep Compass, and they're just sitting there, stopped in the middle of the road. There's no traffic in town at this point, so it's just a car sitting on the road. How fucking creepy. I've never been one to be shy, so I turn my car back on and get on the road. I'm headed to Planet Fitness since they're 24 hours, and there should be lots of people there. And the white and silver car started following me. Whenever I would pull into a parking lot, they would just circle, but never actually come in. I don't know why I wasn't smart enough to call the cops, but I just wasn't. Hindsight is 2020. After sitting there for 5 to 10 minutes and I don't see either car, I take off again. But now I'm heading to a different highway. And I realized after driving that, I'm trapped between them. The white car is in the front of me and the silver car is is three car lengths back behind me. The white car pulls off into an apartment complex and just sits. So I pull in next to it, rolled my window down and ask, Why are you following me? 
I took pictures of her face, license plates, and vehicle, and I have some video of her following me around. She never makes eye contact with me or rolls her window down. She backs out and peels down the road. And then I see the silver car take off. At this point, I follow because I want photos of the silver car too, in case I do end up going to the police. They both separate and tried to lose me, but I know where they live when Car X's garage. So I head back to that area, also my neighborhood, and see them both parked there. So I started taking pictures of the silver car too and the young couple. I asked the teenage looking kids, why are you following me around? And they said, we aren't following you. You're following us. Why are you taking pictures? And I said, My husband is a state sheriff, and I'm letting him know people like you are harassing me. This is a lie. I'm not married. But I panicked and didn't know what else to say. So they said, We're not harassing you. We're at home. You should go home too. And then they went inside. This address was clearly having a party, lots of cars in their driveway and on the street. I'm too wound up again to just drive home, so I decided to do two more laps around the neighborhood, just to calm down. It's now 10.47 p.m., and I finally calmed down, about to drive down to the end of the neighborhood I live in. That's when I noticed a burgundy crossover that could possibly be following me. At this point, I think there's no fucking way they got a third person to follow me. So, I'm just going to drive normal, but watching them behind me as well. Everywhere I go, they go. So, I pulled into the driveway of a house for sale, and they just sit and turn off their lights, and put my car in eco mode so, so you can hear it running. They're just sitting down the street watching me. Then they take off. And where did they end up parking? Where car X is garaged. So I get more pictures of this house and all the cars and license plates again. I do three to four more laps, but around the town now, not just my neighborhood. At this point, it's 11 p.m. and I'm not calm at all. I'm just fucking paranoid but I don't see any of the vehicles following me anymore. But I can't be sure now, so I do one last drive-by to see if the cars are still at Car X's house. And they are. And I finally go home. No cars passed my house last night. I stayed up until 3 a.m. just watching and waiting. Am I crazy and paranoid? Was I the harasser here? I'm just trying to make sense of it all. When I was 17, I was living in one of those small towns without the community feel. It was a toxic place, rampant with drug addiction and crime. I learned from a young age to watch my back and where not to go past dark or ever. This town held a lot of trauma for me. Some trauma is even scarier than this incident I'm about to share with you. I left this town a few short months after this incident, and I would never think about moving there at this point ever in my life. For context, I was working a lot and finishing up my senior year, and we didn't have a working washer and dryer at home. So, I had to go to the laundromat to do my laundry. I lived on the outside of town. It took five minutes to get into town, but we were so secluded. There were two street lights, and I lived on a street between two mountains. We were down the street from this abandoned dairy farm. We had acres to ourselves. We were really, really secluded. It was so dark out there, and there was only my street and a cross street to get to my street. So, you know, when a car was on the road. 
One afternoon, I found some time to take my laundry to the laundromat, and I took my mom and brother's laundry with me so my mom wouldn't have to do it during her work week. This meant I had three times the laundry to do, and it would take longer at the laundromat, but there was a Hastings next door, so I didn't worry too much, as long as I was able to leave before dark, as it wasn't a very good idea or a good area to be in. By the time I left, the sun was almost down, so it all worked out. By the time I was on the cross street to get to my street, it was completely dark and I was all alone out there. I thought I'd turned on to my street, and within seconds, there was someone behind me, as close as they could get to me without hitting me, and they had their brights on. This confused me, as I had seen no other cars before I turned onto my street. It was like their lights were off until they were directly behind me. This gave me a pit in my stomach. So I sped up, but they kept up behind me. This was a windy, dark road, and my headlights were poor, so I was really starting to get anxious. I made a judgment call and drove right past my driveway. I didn't feel right possibly alerting some creep to where I live with my mom and baby brother, especially since cell reception was so poor out there. The person behind me was still just as close as they could get to my bumper, and I kept speeding up. I knew that up ahead there was a fork in the road. Going straight would lead to the downtown area, and it's the way people go when they are heading that way. To go to the left, you entered a residential area with only a few homes and a road that only really allowed one car at a time. At the last second, I turned onto the street without turning my blinker on in hopes that the car behind me would keep driving straight. They turned with me. By this point, I was very scared, but still hopeful that maybe the car behind me lived in that area. We were going close to 50 miles per hour by now and just speeding up as the car behind me wasn't backing off but staying as close as they could. They stayed so close that I couldn't even tell the make of their vehicle, or rather they were driving a car or SUV or a truck. I definitely couldn't tell who it was in the vehicle. I couldn't understand why they wouldn't back off, and I, well, I was afraid that if I slowed down, they would rear in me. All of a sudden, I see a home directly in front of me, the street was at a 90 degree angle and I had to turn left or crash into the home in front of me. Luckily, my car made the turn. I kept going and made a left to get onto the road that leads downtown. The car was still behind me. They didn't live in that neighborhood. At this point, I'm sure they're following me and I make the decision to drive to the sheriff's office, but I'm not sure how to get there. We're going around 60 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone. And I recognize will lead to the sheriff's office. So I turn. But I turn so late that I might as well have made a U-turn. Finally, the car behind me can't make the turn and they keep driving. I drove around and made a lot of turns to ensure the car wouldn't end up directly behind me. Finally, I pulled over my car and cried. I was safe this time, but I went home terrified and it changed the way I drive to this day. I moved to a more populated city and I live in a large apartment complex, but I still drive past my old apartment when I got a weird feeling that something or someone was behind me. Any time someone pulls in to the apartment behind me. I drive right past my apartment and circle the complex until I can park with no one behind me. My paranoia possibly saved me and my mom and baby brother from something that could have been so much worse. Pay attention to the people around you and behind you. 
waste the gas, and drive past your home. If you're scared, it may save your life. Four years ago, after just getting my degree, I decided it was time to leave my hometown and pursue my career. So I moved to a big city that was nine hours away from my parents and most of my family. I had no friends there for months and my starting salary was low because I came into the company as a trainee. I was very demotivated and I missed my family a lot. At some point, I decided to go visit the relatives who lived close by the coast, which was four to five hours away in the car. I didn't have a car and the buses were expensive, but my cousin told me about this Facebook group of rides between my city and another city that was close to their town. I went there and found myself a ride with some university students who were just a few years younger than me. The day for the trip came by. I met them, and in total, it was five of us in a wide sedan. A lady who was studying medicine, owner of the car, her boyfriend, the driver, a sophomore girl who was friends with them, and one random young guy who found their ad on Facebook. We're just going to call him Mark. It was a Friday, and people from this whole region were infamous for drinking extremely often. So, inspired by the warning my cousin gave me, I awkwardly asked them, Sorry to, um, ask, but none of you have drunk recently or planned to do it on our trip, right? The driver assured me that he was fully sober and that he wouldn't have any, even if the passengers did. After hearing that, his girlfriend and the other girl assured that they wouldn't drink because their parents were very strict and wouldn't let them misbehave. Mark giggled when hearing that and whispered to me, Women in their town are infamous for drinking a lot and denying it. The trip went on and we went around dozens of mountains. We had a few conversations about university and work, but most of the trip was us just listening to music to a popular singer from the 90s. After around two hours and a half, the driver stopped the car at a gas station as he needed the WC. Mark decided to go with them as he wanted to get something from the store. A few minutes later, I see Mark and our driver come back out to the car, even holding a six-pack of cerveza. Well, actually, the driver was carrying two of them. I almost freaked out, but kept my composure and asked them if they were going to drink now. The driver said, I won't until I'm done driving, but let the others and yourself take one or two if they want. Almost two hours later, we had left the mountains and arrived to a flatland. The sign said we were one kilometer away from the city. Suddenly, the car took a right turn leaving the main road and headed towards the suburbs. The place looked desolated and most of the houses seemed empty. I thought it was a bit weird but didn't ask anything because I assumed that maybe we were dropping the other girl. They probably already knew where she lived. The dude just parked the car on the yard of an abandoned house and said, We are basically home. You guys down for some drinks? Mark was totally down with it, but the girls kept saying stuff as, Um, I'm not sure. I don't usually drink. Or, okay, I'll make this one exception. Or, only because we had tough midterms. I refused and said, But how are we going to get to the city? You guys agreed to take me to the bus station. They said that it was already very close and that in the worst case scenario, I could just walk there. I was more worried because I planned to take the local bus at a certain hour to then get to my cousin's town, which was still an hour away from there. They started drinking, 
really fast, and the girls got to the point where they were trying to pee doing a handstand against a wall. I was desperate to leave, but I didn't feel safe walking to the city because it was really dark out there and this region had a bad reputation for crime. Outsiders were specifically more at risk. There was no phone signal there, so I had to wait for these guys and see what they could offer me. They finally decided it was time to go home. I said it wasn't okay for any of them to drive anymore because they were all drunk and I offered to drive. However, the driver said, It's not up to you. The car belongs to my girlfriend. However, his girlfriend refused, saying that she didn't even know me and her dad wouldn't be okay with a stranger driving the car. I said I understood that, but that we had to sort this out somehow. After a bit, the driver finally got off from the driver's seat. I assumed they would let me drive. I was sitting in the middle of the back seat, so I asked the guys next to me to let me get off and out of the car. The sophomore girl, who was in my left, did, but before I could stop her, she climbed into the driver's seat. This girl started saying, Friend, please let me drive. It's so close and there's no one outside anymore. The other girl said, Okay, sure, but go slow, okay? The previous driver got into the back seats with me and confined me back to the middle seat. I was getting upset and wanted to stop her, but I didn't know how to because everyone seemed okay with this idea. My panic got even worse when the sophomore girl started asking them how to turn on the car and how to operate it. You don't know how to drive a car? I asked in despair. <laughs> no, I don't. It's my first time trying. My parents haven't let me learn yet, she answered. Get down then, please. I have a driver's license. I can get you home safely, I said. Then the car's owner told me. I couldn't decide over her car and said that it would be okay, that there was almost no one out driving at this hour and that they would help her friend learn how to drive. I asked them to let me get off the car and they wouldn't let me. They swore it was a very short drive and that we would go slowly and that it would be okay. The girl really had no idea about how to drive. Unfortunately, this was an automatic transmission car. Had it been a manual one, and she probably wouldn't have been able to drive that one, let alone move it. And the car moved, but in the ways you would expect for it to move with a driver who had never stepped on the pedals of an actual car. She would hit the brake and steer the wheel too hard. She drove in the middle of the road and kept freaking out while the others yelled at her what to do. I was begging them to let me off and get out of the car, but they wouldn't listen to me. Fortunately, the streets were empty, but I couldn't help to fear that if any car would have been out, for sure we would have crashed against it. Eventually, we made it to the street where the bus station was. As soon as they pointed that out, I asked them to just stop the car already and let me walk from there. But they did not. They forced me to be dropped in front of the station. I don't even know how I could get out of this sort of situation if I was in it ever again. This happened a couple of summers ago as my boyfriend and I were driving along a remote forest service road in British Columbia, Canada, returning from a camping trip. We're pretty familiar with the area we're in, having camped there several times before. Typically, the only people we encounter out there, a good 70 kilometers from paved roads, are fellow campers in off-road vehicles or logging truckers on the job. 
This particular day was beautiful, sunny, and warm, mid-June. We were bumping down the road at a good clip when we saw a man come out of the bush and begin frantically waving at us. Very odd. We slowed down and came to a stop when my boyfriend rode down the window to see what this guy had to say. I was in the passenger seat, and as soon as we slowed down, I picked up a weird vibe. He was wearing a blue plaid construction worker's flannel coat, much too heavy for the warm weather, with khaki pants and work boots on, was clean-shaven with messy gray-brown hair, pale skin and large glasses. He was maybe in his 50s? Let me stress how unusual it is to run into somebody way out there without a vehicle. This guy was fairly soft-spoken and calmly, almost robotically, told us that his car battery is dead. He asked us for a jump. Okay, sure, we believe in road karma and always want to help out people in between when we're out in the bush. But where's the car? He tells us he's been fishing all day and had been playing his radio and it caused his battery to die. The car is down a very overgrown side of the road a little further up the main road. He walks ahead while we slowly follow behind him in our truck. Both my boyfriend and I are a bit weirded out and we joke around to each other as we're following him that we hope he's not luring us into the bush to kill us. Except I legit felt on edge and the joke didn't seem that funny. We followed him about 150 meters down the overgrown side road into a small heavenly treed area just wide enough for about four cars to park side by side. We never would have noticed this road if he hadn't pointed it out to us because bushes had nearly covered the entrance. Anyway, sure enough, there is a car there, an older model beige Chevy car that looks very unsuited to the rough logging roads. The trunk is open for some reason and a blanket is draped over it. The hood had already popped on the car, so my boyfriend got out, grabbed our jumper cables from the back seat of the truck, and began affixing the cables to the car. Meanwhile, I swung my leg over the center console and slid into the driver's seat. I felt very uneasy and looked around the cab for anything that would be a weapon, all while telling myself I was being silly. But... Nonetheless, I wanted to be ready to act if something threatening happened. The guy chatted with my boyfriend and jovially, telling him about his buddy who he was fishing with, but who went on ahead without him. But his friendliness seemed forced. He stood back, allowing my boyfriend to do everything, lingering behind him, watching, while boyfriend got the car batteries hooked up. There was an awkward pause and my boyfriend had to prompt the guy to go get in his car to crank it over. Throughout this, I sat in that driver's seat watching, feeling very tense. The car fired up easily and the guy got back out of the driver's seat. He said thank you in an oddly intense way. My boyfriend removed the cables and hopped back into the passenger seat without bothering to put the cables away properly. And the moment the door passenger door closed, I was reversing back down the narrow side road with branches scraping across both sides of our car. We got onto the main road within moments and went on our way. My boyfriend told me that the guy watched us the entire time as I backed down the road. Could have been just a socially awkward guy with a legitimately dead battery, but I can't help but to feel this guy's intentions were more sinister, and the fact that I stayed vigilant in the car, and that my boyfriend was efficiently 
competent with the jumper cables. It helped us dodge a bullet, I do believe. Not sure if the battery really was dead in the first place, but neither of us remember seeing any fishing gear. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true driving at night horror stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Cindy Cleveland, Patty's niece, Samantha Place, Coleman Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chrissy Elias, Denise S., Tina Mead, Lus Crispin, Tammy Slayton, Anita V., Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Sugar Spite. Thank you all for your continued support of Back to Ashes, for without you, there would not be a me, or there wouldn't be a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you so much. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.